So delighted that they are our friends, and I'm so delighted to have them here. Would you welcome Chris and Ann Hogan? One, two, you're three. Good, you're good. Got it going? All right. Yep. It is a joy to be here with you all. And uh, I'm so glad I get to bring my wife. A lot of times I travel far, and she doesn't always get to come. And so we got to drive up here 60 miles and hang out. And I love hanging out with Ann. Can you imagine 12 children? People say, all that came from one wife, one at a time. <laughs> she just keeps chasing me around, and I we keep coming. <laughs> Uh, that's not funny to her, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so we really uh, have enjoyed and embraced this, this theme that you gave us, uh, family on mission. And that was before Ann and I got married, that was the vision that we had. And so God showed us, uh, we were discipled by Dale Craw uh, for three years and for four. And so he's always been a, a continual influence when we were single uh, we were discipled down there with him. I was one of his associates. And then we got married. And, uh, and so we're going to give you the high level of what it looks like to go on a journey to be a family of mission. It's just going to be, we're going to take you up pretty high and let you see what this looks like, okay? We're going to use a little analogy. And then Anne is going to uh, come up and share with you a very practical thing on part of this journey. So we're going to move quick. We got 35 minutes. And uh, we're just going to, it's like you're, you're I'm going to sell you on a cruise, okay? A cruise with the Lord on this journey. Actually, this is an overland journey. And uh, by the time we're done, I'm going to have you come up and sign up for this. And it will cost you your life. Literally, cost you your life. But when you lose your life, you will absolutely gain it. It will be the most exciting. Some of us get bored, especially through this COVID. We've gotten bored. And so we want challenge. So I, I like challenge, but I also like peace and calm, so we need a balance of that. Anne? Uh, well, two things. Um, I wanted just to say that uh, we have 10 awesome daughters, and I call them princesses, <laughs> and um, some, yeah, and then two amazing young men, and um, yeah, people say, wow, that's really wild, like 10 <laughs> girls, like that must be really... Yeah, wild in your house, and um, but I say, whether they know the Lord or they don't, I just say, you know what? They all know the Lord Jesus Christ, and that makes all the difference. So some of them know what that means, and then some of them, it's it's a seed, and they're like, wow, because you know, by God's grace, I usually look sane, and so, and so they're like, yeah, wow, really, and. Um, and then, may I just uh, pray for you yeah, and yeah. Uh, and for you all too? And uh, it's amazing how we learn things from people. And uh, I sort of learned this prayer from from a person who went to be with the Lord this last year. But mm -hmm. Father, we just uh, thank you and praise you. We come before you this morning, mm -hmm. Lord. We we fix our eyes on you. You mm -hmm. are the author and the finisher of Thanks. our faith. Lord Jesus, you have made us as sons and daughters unique in Christ Jesus, and you've put our families together unique. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, we just um, give this morning to you. We thank you for the encouragement and the blessing that's already come. We just ask that you would give Chris um, blessing and anointing on his words and myself for what I share. Lord, I thank you and praise you that you would, whatever is shared, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak you. to the hearers yes. exactly mm -hmm. what you want them to hear mm -hmm. and how they can apply it in their thank lives you, for each family, mm -hmm. each mom and dad are are unique and special and we don't want to put on uh, give them armor that doesn't fit them but Lord from what we share mm -hmm. Lord you can share them with them what you have for them amen. hallelujah in Jesus name amen amen 
All right. You can just hold on to that, Ann, and come back up. Uh, our first one is uh, this slide, that noble call slide, if you see it. Uh, Ann and I, before we were married, we were memorizing the, uh, scripture, and this was one of them. Noble men make noble plans, and by noble deeds they stand. And, uh, and then when it came time to develop a ministry, that was such a, 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 a word for us that we knew our calling was to help people discover their, their calling in five life roles as a person, as a partner, as a parent, as a provider, and as a proclaimer. And we'll show you where we saw that in the scripture in just a minute or two. But uh, so most of my job is to help them define that calling and then create that plan and coach them through that, that journey. So some people, I'm, uh, I'm on their permanent payroll, I think. <laughs> and so with certain businesses. And, uh, and so it's just a, it's a constant getting through that journey to where you get to the place where you want to be. And then you help other people do the same. And we take people on these journeys. Um, I was working in the homeschool world for about 15 years. Uh, and my job was to help men be successful in their relationships and discern what's going on that's I'm trying to engage in my home, and it doesn't seem to work. I can do it in business, but I get home, and if I try to lead a Bible study, my wife's sitting there like this going, really? That's how you're going to do that? And, uh, or I, uh, I end up having a little bit of a blow-up, and then we sit down the next day to have the Bible, and the kids are sitting there going, I dare you try to teach me something. Just try. Uh, and so men tend to go, you know, I feel like taking that Bible and just throwing it across the wall. Well, if you want to do it better than me, just do it. You know, I'm going to go where people respect me. Yeah. Well, they respect you because you signed their checks. That's the only way. Trust me, man. You know? And so those are those real difficulties that we engage in in our homes. And if you can't figure that out, it's hard to go on mission elsewhere because we feel like we have nothing to impart to anyone else other than a virus. So we keep it to ourselves. We go... We're dangerous, we're toxic, trust me, we are. <laughs> we might have to get up and speak to people and travel, but it's not good. And you don't have that anointing and that courage and that, that, that uh, ability to really go forth with, uh, with strength, right? And so how do you do that? You know, how do you stay on mission? So I, wanna, so one, I would go to these, some, some, sometimes they would invite me to come and speak at these places and they'd give us a booth and I'd walk around and one of my jobs was literally to go into families. I'd go for a three-day deal. I'd fly in at noon, and these would be large families that were imploding. And they'd been in the homeschool world all their life. I'm like, wow. I'd get there, and I would, um, the first, at noon, we would have a meeting with the whole family, and I'd have the, before I'd ever show up, the parents would have to say to their, have to agree that this is not me coming to fix the kids. This is me coming to figure out what's going on in the parenting because the children are reacting to the parents. They're not in rebellion. Yeah, they're in rebellion. <laughs> they're actually in rebellion maybe to not from what you think it is. It's really a reaction. People respond or react to you based on what they perceive you think and feel about them. So oftentimes the parents are giving off a message that the children can't interpret accurately. So they perceive or think that you feel something about them that isn't good. And that makes them feel like you're putting their head under water and they can't breathe. And so how does a drowning person act? Desperate. desperate. So sometimes you just see children who are being very desperate. And it looks like rebellion, but really they're just drowning because they perceive you're taking away their oxygen. Their spiritual, emotional, and mental oxygen, right? And so what we do is we go in there and we would, we would work through these things. And once we restored the relationships, people once again could get on the journey. And, uh, and, and that was really one of the big things I did. So when I would walk around these big homeschool conventions, I'd go, we don't need a better math curriculum. We don't need a better academic curriculum. We need a relationship curriculum. So I set about creating a relationship curriculum, and, and I did. And, then, um, and that's what I use when I coach people. But then a company in Singapore said, Chris, could we take your curriculum and can we... Uh, contextualize it for businesses. And so then we, uh, we, we did. And so we, they spent about almost a million dollars uh, converting this into a learning and development program that they do with multinational companies now. So I was just in Shenzhen, China uh, a few years ago, and the company that creates our iPhone cameras and the little micro technology that goes in there, it's, by the way, Samsung and, and my, Apple have the same camera, different software. So I work with that company. They have uh, about 45,000 people, and these were the 22 global leaders, each from a different nation, 
and they didn't talk to each other anymore. So we used the basic homeschool relationship curriculum to teach them how to talk. And at the end of the day, they all were asking each other forgiveness. And I went up to my room and I cried. I was like, God, that's amazing. I didn't know this stuff would work with that level. And he said, Chris, why are you surprised? He said, I didn't give my son to the world just to save Israel. He's a light to the whole world. And every single person I create resonates to my truth. Whether you quote scripture or don't, they resonate to me. And all you did was share the truth that they were meant to originally resonate with. And it got them back on track with me. That opened my eyes to a whole other realm. So that's what we're going to teach a little bitty piece of that today to you guys. Journey of a family on mission. Three elements of a journey. This is always this case. I'm going to use an analogy real quick, all right? So about five years ago, I asked my wife, uh, honey, would you be willing to let me uh, invest in a couple of vehicles to go up into the mountains with and um, take people on what we call noble adventures now? And we'll take our children. And uh, she says, well, what's it, what's it entail? I said, well, it entails these vehicles with big tires and, and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. And we well, just don't spend more than that, though, honey. I don't think we should do that because I don't see how the Lord's going to be in this. <laughs> I said, well, it will get me uh, a little charged up again. And so there was some, I just felt the leading of the Lord to do that because I'm a pretty good steward with my finances, but I had this freedom to do this and there were some opportunities. And so every journey though includes a destination. <clears throat> Three elements of a journey. The first one is a destination. Now, oh, uh, ooh, that, that, that's not going to come up one at a time, is it? Okay, so yeah, you can just take that off. Uh, if you've ever seen Banff, Canada, uh, Banff, Canada has got this Lake Moraine up there. And I remember seeing it. If you Google Banff, Canada, Lake Moraine, you're going to see this beautiful glacier lake. And I saw that. And that's why I told my wife, hey, you mind if we buy some vehicles to go up there? <laughs> and so it was enough of a, a vision to me to go, I want to see that place. I don't know where that's at. I, I, I uh, Googled it. Where is this? And it says, North America. I said, I can get to North America. I don't have to get on a plane to fly. And it was so beautiful that it inspired me. And then I started looking at other places, Moab, uh, Utah, and, um, and these mountains up and throughout Colorado and the West, and just all these beautiful places. I said, I want to go there. And I don't camp. I, I really don't like to camp. Uh, I don't mind glamping. I just don't want to camp, uh, you know. But when I saw those locations, I said, yeah, I would go up there. If I could, I would camp if I could go there. So the destination is something that absolutely grabs your attention, says that is worth investing time, energy, and money and planning to get there. So the same thing is true when you take a journey as a family on mission. You got to get very clear about the destination. And I'm going to just share with you a destination that Ann and I had in our mind that motivated us before we were married and to this day. I knew it was a big enough destination that it would take our whole lifetime to get there. I wanted one that big that it was worth saying no because it was such a burning yes, I could say no to a lot of other things because a lot of things are begging for your attention, like a Super Bowl game and everything else, right? Everything's begging and trying to distract or, or, or get our attention, uh, but sometimes it's not just for one day, it's for a long time, and so we can get distracted. <clears throat> so the destination is the first thing. The second thing is the map. You'll need a map to get there. So when you get off-road maps, you'll see these off-road maps because you, you're, you're not going to have your GPS anymore. It won't work on your phone because you're going to be in a very remote area where they don't put GPSs. Maybe 1% of the population will ever see these areas. And so you have to have a paper map. And they have books where people have gone out and they say, hey, set your odometer at zero, go, because there's no road sometimes. Go this far, you'll see a, a cow patty on the left side or something, you know. Or, uh, but, uh, and then it says, you know, you're going to go left, right, and, and you're just fine. And they map them out as green, just about most vehicles can get there. A regular SUV could get there. Sometimes cars, no, but a regular SUV would definitely be able to get to this place. And then there's a blue one that says, you definitely need a modified vehicle. You need one that's got at least this size of tires. It needs at least this much of a lift. You're probably not going to have body damage, but you are going to freak some people out in your vehicle as you're driving. Uh, but it's moderate, <clears throat> okay? And then it's going to give you the red ones. 
You will get body damage most likely on this one, so count your cost. Uh, and, and this is how it is. And, but there are some little wraparounds. If you get to one of these on the blue, there is a little alternative thing that you can go around this way and possibly get around. So don't worry, you can keep, up, keep on going. So you get to choose which route you want to be on, depending on your skill and your vehicle. And, and so it's a map. So we have to be able to look at our maps and say, if that's the destination, what's the mental map I have that's going to get me there? <clears throat> and this is where it takes a husband and a wife, or it takes a people in your life if you're single who can know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and can be complimentary to you because they may be able to see things you can't see at the time. Because every, every journey, see, we don't realize just how much you have to do recovery when you take journeys. Why do you have a spare in the back of your car? Because somebody thinks you're going to need to recover one day because these things break down. And we get upset. God is not with us. He, God must have forsaken us because we got a flat tire. Now, some people drive on ball tires. I, I don't like to drive on ball tires. I go, well, why don't you just go get a new one instead of waiting until it pops? Well, God gives divine appointments in the middle of a, a breakdown. You never know who comes. I go, really? You view life like that? Yeah. I go, wow, I've never seen it that way, you know? <laughs> I was getting some new tires from uh, uh, the Bates. I don't know if you know the Bates. They have that movie, The Bates. We were down there, and I said, hey, I want to get some uh, new tire. And, and uh, he said, that looks fine. I said, no, it's pretty bad. Matter of fact, I'm going to replace all four. And he goes, well, I could get another 10,000 miles out of those tires. I said, man, you'll be driving a little close to bald. He goes, oh, I'll take them tires. I'll put them on my van. I said, well, you can have them. Just, you know. <laughs> I said, uh, he said, yeah, we find all kinds of divine appointments on the side of the road when we're broke down. Man, not, not me, man. <laughs> but, uh, but when you go on journeys, you have to be aware there will be breakdowns. And when you go off road, you have to make sure that you, if you get on a red or a blue, you got to have a winch. You got to have what they call max tracks. That's three hundred dollars. You got to have a, uh, a a tree saver because when you wrap your thing around the tree, you don't want to hurt the tree, right? Uh, and so there's all kinds of equipment, and you buy that, and you actually become an expert at recovery, and you learn from these experts. So you actually expect to get recovered or to recover. You don't always bring the equipment for yourself to recover because maybe. You don't need it for yourself. You got a Toyota. You don't have one of these other ones. <laughs> if you got a Jeep, us Toyota guys recover the Jeeps. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I just lost half of my crowd out there. But uh, anyway, so what you do though is, is that you actually have that because you know you're going to need to recover somebody out there on the side of the road because these things will do damage to your tires and your undercarriage, right? Uh, I even had a welder on one of my vehicles. I didn't know how to weld, but I knew some Jeep guy would know how to weld. <laughs> and so you have a map, and then you need a mode of transport. Uh, and so the transport is, is the vehicle. And you have to decide, where do I want to go, and what vehicle is necessary to get on that to that place. And what's interesting is, on these maps, they will have what they call, on these routes or trails, they will have what's called a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper has these big boulders in, fr in front of the, uh, in the midst of the, right at the gate of the, tr uh, the, the route or the trail. So you might go in and they'll say, hey, come through this neighborhood or go through this campground. You'll come to a sign. Uh, it's got all the boulders right there. And you have to cross those boulders. And those boulders are big. So if your vehicle can't get across those boulders, then you can't get on the trail. And that means you won't get too far into the trail, break down, and then have to walk your way back out. Nor will it cost you a fortune to have somebody come in there and get you out. So they create these big boulders because they don't want you there because your vehicle isn't equipped and maybe you're not equipped to be on that trail. And so um, that's the true in life too. So there are some things God does not want you on that trail yet because you're not equipped for that yet. You don't have the skill for that journey just yet. And he wants to help you to, to take these other trails and get a little bit more prepared for those bigger trails, right? So three things on a journey. You need a destination, very clear. You need a map, and you need a, a means of transport. Well, in this journey I'm talking about, when it comes to you getting as a family on mission, um, there is a destination that you need to pick out. Uh, and it's what God says is the destination he has for your life, the plans and the purposes. So I want to just give you a verse that maybe 
gives you a little bit of an insight to this, right? John 13, 35, it says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. He has this destination that he wants to bring you to. And that is to experience the fullness of what it means to love God and love others. And the, the joy of that. Because if you go on mission too quick and you don't have that down, it is the fuel. It is the energy that allows you to keep going. If you have love one for another, uh, in, in Psalm 16 it says, in your presence is fullness of, and, in your, and at your right hand is pleasures forevermore. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So when you have that sense of being in God's presence, you have this ability to, to enter into this joy, and the joy strength that's required to be on one of these missions takes a lot. Uh, when I saw Banff, Canada, I said, I want to go there. So I got the vehicle, got the vehicle, got the tires on the vehicle, got the lift on the vehicle, got uh, all the, everything re ready to go. And we, uh, we did a few of these other journeys before we got to Banff. And uh, we went to Colorado, we went to Moab, Utah, we did a lot of different things. And I said, okay, son, this is the one, we're going to, to Banff. And I paid my money to get into the national park up there. And we're driving, this is a, a kind of a heavy vehicle, it's a, a Toyota Land Cruiser. And uh, it's, it's got all the equipment for two weeks, the kitchen in the back. And as we're 35 miles away from Lake Lorraine, the one that I saw in the picture, that morning, I was taking a friend of mine and his two sons and my son, and this was a passage into manhood for this one of his sons. And so that morning, we did a study on um, what it takes to become a man. I said, the one thing you have to know as a man is how to encourage yourself in the Lord, because you may come home, and your home is on fire, and your children are gone, and you're, or, I mean, not literally on fire. Your, your wife just might be on fire at you. <laughs> And, uh, and so you have to know uh, how to encourage yourself in the Lord and how to continue to pursue, overtake, and recover all like David did when everybody was mad at him. And we talked about that that morning. They wrote it in their journals. We got, on the, got in the vehicle. We crossed the border. We're 35 miles from Lake Lorraine, that beautiful picture I had in my mind. And um, somebody from England had just uh, had rented a little mini uh, white car. And they came around this mountain, and they stopped to take a picture of this beautiful glacier stream. Well, I came around the mountain going 55 miles an hour, too. And it, this is easy to do in a national park. You stop instead of pulling over to the side where they give you the place to pull over. You're just in awe, and you see it, and you stop. But when I came around, I saw them, and I couldn't stop. I tried to stop, but it was a 6,500-pound vehicle. So I thought, I either go to the right and hit the mountainside, or I go to the left and try to get around them because there's no cars coming. It was all split second. So I decided to go ahead and swerve over to the left. But the vehicle was so heavy, when I turned my wheels back to kind of get in, the vehicle just went right over a cliff, and it, and it came across 45 feet into the embankment on the other side, and it bounced up, it hit some trees, took out some trees, and they couldn't even see the vehicle. It was so far into the woods. And we just went like this. We closed our eyes. My, my friend said, this is not good. And... <laughs> And all I did was just close my eyes. And, uh, and we just hit that other side. And I just felt my body. And I didn't know, maybe I'm in shock and maybe parts are off my body. I didn't want to open my eyes. Uh, but we stopped. And then I felt my friend scuttle to get out of the sunroof. And uh, the engine revved up. And so I just reached my hand in there and I turned off the key. And I really didn't want to open my eyes because I thought, I'm in shock and there's parts of my body that are missing. There's no way we survived that. And then my son said, Dad, you okay? I said, yeah, you okay? He said, yeah. <laughs> and we climbed out the sunroof. And we patted each other. We said, I'm looking at my friend's kids. I'm looking at him. I said, you okay? We're alive. I don't have any blood on me. We survived that. And people came running into the woods. They go, Where's this? where are the people? I said, we're them. You can't be them. Somebody died in that. No. So here's what I want to tell you. On some journeys, you can have a wreck. And you're going to need to be recovered. And you know what my friend said? He said, should I call my son and tell him to come pick us up? He'll be here in about 10 hours to bring the truck. And the little son said, well, can't we just do what, make this an object lesson? He's a homeschooler. Can't we just make this an object lesson and do what we studied this morning? 
He says, what's that, son? Can't we just encourage ourselves in the Lord and pursue and overtake and recover all? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Dan goes, and the fireman says, I can take you into Banff and they'll get you a, a, a rental car. And they'll go to Calgary over there and get it. And so the, we gathered everything we could out of that vehicle that I spent two years getting ready. And we, uh, he said, you'll never see it again, but that vehicle did what it was supposed to do. He looked at me, this, this guy looked at me. We had the Calgary police, we had the, um, the Mounties, we had the National Park police, we had the firemen all there. And they looked at me and they said, I want you to know something. This is a good day when nobody died. That vehicle did what it was supposed to do, say thanks and walk away. And by the way, I know what you're thinking. I said, what's that? He said, I want to show you something. We walked up that hill. He said, look at these tire marks. You did try to turn. You didn't run your family off the cliff. You tried. Let me tell you something. Us guys sometimes feel like or we're, we're being told that we're ruin, running our family off the cliff. You screwed up. They told that to David. There's times that we just got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And we got to say, God, how do we get back up? And so my buddy went and got the, the rental car and the, they took us in. We cleaned up at the Banff Fire Station. We had our destroyed, some of our, the boxes were all, all these boxes up on top. We had parts and pieces of stuff and tents and we gathered it all together. We organized it. It was dirty and muddy and, and we lost things. I found my glasses, my phone. We found all of our phones. It was quite amazing. None of them were broken. And, uh, and the buddy comes up and we get a U-Haul the next day. We throw all of our stuff in and we spent another eight days traveling through Banff, Canada and down through Glacier and swimming and and, uh, and I was a bit in shock, but we had to learn how to recover, right? Those things happen. But the destination, I did get to Banff. And you're not always looking pretty when you get there. <laughs> but we can get there. God can get us there, amen? <laughs> but the destination is that we would have love one for another. That people would grab our arms and say, let us go with you. For we see that you love one another. Ultimately, that's the destination of experiencing that kind of love that we receive from our Father. And we've given it one to another. Um, the map is Corinthians 13. How do we get there? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is a really step-by-step -step thing. That takes the longest for me to coach someone to do. Love bears all things. What does it mean? To, you know what it takes to be equipped to literally deal well with your family members' weaknesses? Just to learn how to bear well with others' weaknesses to where you handle it with grace and truth. That lesson alone, that, that's a long time getting that. I'm working with couples right now. I coach, my, my main thing is I coach people. 99% of those are over the phone uh, from all over the world. But teaching them that map alone and what it takes to get to that place where you're receiving enough from God to do that. One lady, she finally got, she says, is it the way that when I go to God when I feel really bad or when I really feel good, I've got this image in my mind. I go and I lay my head on his lap and he, um, he looks at me the same way whether I had a good quiet time and I managed well my home or when I really was a bear that day and my, I almost wanted to eat my cubs. And my wife says, it's kind of like the GPS person, where no matter how many wrong turns you make, it says, course correcting, or whatever that term is, right? And it never changes its tone of voice. <laughs> you know, and I said, yeah, it's learning how to bear well with somebody's weaknesses. The second one is, believes all things, hopes all things, or believes all things, that it, you believe the best about their intentions, even though you can't understand their words or actions. Wow, changing your narrative about that. And then hopes all things, willing to give a second chance because it takes a while for us to learn how to show up meaningfully for one another. And then to endure the process of growth in each of your lives and what it takes to course correct and reconnect with each other. 
And then transportation. You are the means of transportation. What is the scripture? John 15, 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. In other words, Jesus says, I received love from my Father. I couldn't make it without that. And when I received it from him, I had something that I could willingly offer to you. In a vehicle, it needs to receive gas. It needs to receive a tune-up. It needs to receive attention. It can't do for you out there what you didn't give it to them at the gas station. You have to give that vehicle some, and you can't get mad and kick it because it ran out of fuel. You literally got to give it what it needs. We need something from the Father. And he says, and stay in this love, abide in this love that you might, until your joy is made complete, until you have enough strength. And then, and only then, do I ask you to go on mission and love others the way I've loved you. Isn't that great? I mean, that's a hallelujah. Just go ahead and say it. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> All right. So this is, we're going to go to that next one. And uh, I realize that we have just a, a few minutes, but I want to, this is very important that you see that. Um, this was supposed to come up person, partner, parent, provider, proclaimer one at a time. But here's what it looks like. At the level of person, I have to learn. You see those words that go around there? It says a reveal, reconcile, restore, redeem, those words. Well, God is going to reveal himself to me as a person. And this is found, this is the noble call. This is the destination, okay? This is my calling that God has called me to. He says, this is the destination I have for you. Now, if you're not married, like Paul was not married, but he still was a partner with many people in ministry. He was a parent to Timothy and Titus, a spiritual parent. Uh, he was a provider in the area of the marketplace when he did tents. And he was a proclaimer. So he was all of these things as a single person. Right? Jesus was, he partnered with the 12 disciples. He parented them spiritually. Uh, and then he provided great, he was a carpenter. And he proclaimed his message. So if you look in Colossians and Ephesians, those two books that Paul wrote, he says in the first few chapters, he spends the most time on your role as a person. He says, as a person, there's a few things you cannot fail to do, or everything else is rendered inconsequential. Let the word of God abide in you richly. Seeing him, psalms, and songs, you know, these are the things that encourage you in the Lord. Uh, put off the old man, put on the new man. It's all the things about person that you have control over. And this is what I mean by control. You have the control to say, oh, Lord, I surrender. Not my will, but thy will. You actually have that. In all the coaching, I can coach people, but I can't surrender for them. Is it that's, that's the only thing I can't do. I can bring you all the way to that place. I can be clear about what the surrender is. I can be clear about what the cost is. But unless you surrender, we'll stay here. Now, I'm going to get paid every month regardless. So you always ask me, how long is it going to take, Chris, as long as it takes for you to surrender? Your fears, your lies, the stories you tell yourself. And I can do that in 30 days. I can figure that out. How long will it take for you to surrender and say, not my will, but thy will? How long will it take for you to say, I'm willing to lose my life and I'll trust that I'll gain it later? Whew, that takes a lot. So what does it look like? As a person, here is the vision that Ann and I had before we got married, that we would develop the full potential of our lives in these five areas. And that we would also then help our children develop their full, full potential. Because this is about loving God as a person and loving others. But there's an order in which that comes, in which we do that, okay? Uh, and so I'm just giving you these concentric circles. To the degree that you want influence in life is the degree that you do this in a certain order, all right? Because what happens is people will come and they'll say, uh, they get married and then they get, they get married and they go, Oh, wow, she's tough. Oh, gee, I got the dud of them all, didn't I? Gee, thanks, God. Uh, and this is tough. And then you get married and you have children. And then, well, she turned them all against me or he turned them all against me. And so now they're all mean. Well, and I work with a bunch of idiots who aren't Christians. I'm just going to go be a missionary and be significant for God. And you miss the whole boot camp. Because God wants to teach us how to receive from him, be reconciled. He'll reveal himself to us so we can be reconciled and learn that whole process of that being forgiven because he who is forgiven much loves much. Isn't that beautiful? 
And then that restoration, I'm restored into who God made me to be. Now I can go and be a part of the redemption process of seeing others be redeemed, bought back. And so he says, okay, I'll give you practice. This woman will give you enough practice to get you where you need to go, trust me. This man will give you enough practice that you will be a shining star when you get to heaven. Yeah, you will have gotten. Now, don't practice the wrong way because practice can go one or two ways. You can practice the wrong way and get really bad or you can learn how to receive truth, reproof, and correction and then start training in the righteous way and be fully equipped for every good work, right? So it depends on how you practice these things, okay? And so he says, uh, then you can, now as, as a, 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 you're receiving from me, you're learning to love and be reconciled and these concepts, and now you're overflowing because you've got energy and you're gonna, your children are going to watch you obeying the commands of Christ. Go therefore and, and, uh, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do what? Observe everything I've taught you. Man, Mom, you were pretty good at that. You apologized quick. I've never seen you apologize so quick. The other night, Ann and I, I'm going to go just a little tad long because you guys are really with me, right? I can tell. Yeah. All right. <laughs> if you need to go, go ahead and go. You're going to miss some of the journey, but that's all right. Uh, no. no, I want to tell myself, I, I, I like to cook. And uh, so Ann will be my sous chef. My 10 girls will be my sous chefs. Uh, and so we kind of got this down. But Ann usually cooks in her pot, and I cook in my pot, or she's helping me. And I... I so I, I had these two filet mignon steaks that we were going to do for us. And I made a, uh, it was our date night that night. <clears throat> and so I made some stew for them because I, I work out of my home. So I had some time in between calls. So I got the stew ready. And, uh, and I, but that night, I'm dreaming of these two filets with a peppercorn cream sauce. And um, it just, it was going to be good. So I got my, my, uh, my, my pan out to get it nice and hot so that would sear good. And I usually take some of the fat, but they don't have no fat on them. Filets don't. So I got some bacon bits in there and let all that fat just do that. I was going to put those babies in there. They were going to get crispy on both sides. Then I was going to make that nice peppercorn pan sauce afterwards. I, so I had the bacon going. I had the big thick cut bacon, bacon in there. And it's just about ready to put my filet in. And Ann comes over with these um, green beans. And I turn around from cutting my little shallots that are getting ready to go in afterwards. And I see her putting one green bean in at a time. I think, wow, she just took my pan. She took my pan with my bacon. What? Hey, don't derail the date night. I've learned you can derail a date night real fast. So I said, just participate with this, okay? And uh, so I see her putting one at a time, and they're starting to get charred. But I'm thinking by the time we get the last ones in, the first ones are going to be charred. The last ones aren't going to be that good. And she goes, well, here, here's some for you. Oh, now I'm her sous chef. All right, so we start getting them in there. And, uh, and then and I put one half of the shallots in there. And so they're getting done. And then uh, I go, okay, good. I didn't say anything. I didn't make any mistakes, you know. I didn't come see, conquer, and then get assassinated. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so it's done. And then I said, okay, so I'm going to go get some more bacon, put it in there, and uh, start putting some in there. And then... Um, I go to put my filet in there, and they're looking good. And I go get my shallots. I go, hey, where are the shallots? Now, in between this time, my daughters had said, hey, what's wrong, Mom? I said, what's wrong, Mom? Why didn't you say what's wrong with Dad? She took my pan. But uh, I've learned that you don't do that. And so I, I looked over at Ann, and she did have a little tear. Or not tear, but I could tell that she, she was by the sink. I said, oh, honey, come over here. I said, um, Oh, what was the vocabulary word? Oh, oh, I said, hey, honey, there's something in cooking called mise en place. It means have everything in place before you cook. So you have all your vegetables already cut. You have your stuff, you know. I've been teaching my kids this stuff, but I I let Ann operate how she operates, and that's fine. But I said, you kind of have to have all your beans cut and everything ahead of time. And so anyway, I said, hey, come come on over, honey. I said, uh... I don't want to ruin our date night. I said, but I know I, I, I'm, I'm a, I got a little irritated. Can you tell me what I said or what I did that, that bothered you? And she, I think she mentioned something. And I know Ann's gifting. She is a, a manager. And I said, uh, you are feeling that I'm telling you you didn't manage this well. And I'm accusing you of not managing well. And that's actually one thing you could do quite well. 
And uh, is that how you're feeling? And she's kind of like, I don't know if that's the only thing I'm feeling, but that's one of them. <laughs> but she doesn't say she's very gracious. She's very gracious to me. I've not heard Ann yell at me. Uh, and she's never called me a name, and nor has she yelled at me. 28 years of marriage, that's pretty good. And so, uh, so she's gracious, and I said, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Um, so anyway, we kind of talked about it. And the girls, my older girls, are like, that's good, Dad. That's good. We got an eye on you. <laughs> and then Mom responded well. They go, Mom, that's pretty good. That's good. They're just observing. Because all of our kids there, I got 12 witnesses all the time, you know. Uh, and they're coaching me because they, they, I coach them. They coach me back now. So we get to do it. And then I go to get my shallots. I go, hey, where are my shallots? And she goes, oops, I put them in the green beans. I go, I'm not going to miss this thing up again. I said, well, okay, we can get some more shields. I'll get them. And so we recovered quickly, right? Uh, but it's those things that you, I wasn't equipped to do that early on in life. I got equipped from a lot of recoveries. I got a lot of practice to get that good at this time. So God gives you lots of opportunities. It's just, are you going to do them, right? So then as a parent, you've got energy to then give that to your children, and you're bringing the best out in your children. That's what managers do. They bring the best out. They help them find their niche. They get in their lane. They flourish. Uh, and they have the energy to do that. And they're responding to you, not reacting to you, right? And then when you get to be in the workplace, you've learned the things you need to know to be able to manage because you're doing it from a secure place. And you're not in the workplace to get your needs met anymore because they're being met with God and your spouse and with your children. Those are meeting deep needs that God wants. We have addictions because we have weak relationships. And so we're very vulnerable if we go into a workplace or into a proclaiming place when these three first relationships aren't in the right place. So that's why Paul says in Colossians and Ephesians, do this as a person. If you're married, do these few things that matter most. If you're a parent, make sure you don't do this, but do this. And then if you're a, 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 a business owner or you're an employee, he says, do these. And then he says, pray for us that we might boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happens when we do this right is that people grab your arm and they say, let us go with you, for we see God is with you. And they grab your arm because they see that, first of all, you've got some peace in the midst of chaos. Your wife still wants to give you a hug and a kiss. And, you, and your husband, well, your wife smiles. The biggest thing that people, you know, it used to give me the most business, they would see my wife smiling at me. They go, how do I get my wife to smile at me? Men will do just about anything to see that wonderful smile again. And then your children want to hug you when they're older. You have love one for another. You must have real Christianity. Can we go with you? And you're not trying to win them. They're trying to get you to invest in them. That's a powerful mission, isn't it? Amen. When they start grabbing your arm because they see that. And there's, that is the most persuasive thing in the gospel a family that loves one another, all right? So we're going to stop there. I hope we gave you a little overview. Uh, I wanted to say, let Ann say one thing about it. The one thing we do is we, we create a home by, to be the seedbed. We call it the five aspects of a home is a ministry center. And Ann has been able to steward this spiritual domain of our home that keeps it safe for us to go out and have ministry out from there. And so... If you would just uh, maybe lead us in a, a prayer here, but we're going to ask all of you, in, after she prays, that how many of you want to say to God, show me the destination? I got that vision of the five life roles before we were married when I was 26 years old. And I said, that would be one that's excited about doing the rest of my life. So we actually teach that all over the world, too, the five life roles. And, uh, and that's what I coach executives, whether they're Christian or not. We coach them in these areas because they've spent... 80% of their time just in the provider role. I said, don't you have a wife? Well, I got two of them. Divorced one, got married another one. She wants to divorce me. So I think we might want to look at these other life roles that you have too, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, we just got to touch on being a missional family, but really, uh, just like Jesus said, you know, what is what does it boil down to? Loving God and then loving others, and that's going to look different for, for each of you. Um, but for you to be able to do that, 
um, just sharing one tool. And my friend Julie, and uh, she came to my house one time and she said, Ann, what would you say is key in your life? And, and, and there are various keys, you know, when it comes to family and all of that, but, and you, you can't write all those off really quickly. Um, uh, but we'll pray for mentors that you can watch the fruit of their life and ask them, how did you get that fruit? Um, but one key thing uh, is I have various sets of flags, and they mean different things. But this one uh, stands for the blood of Jesus to me and the fire of God. So I get a double, you know. And, um, and as a mom, sometimes new moms, I would be waking up at 2 a.m. feeding babies, you know, and, and I would be a little upset I was getting up, and then I'm like, no, you know what, it's time to pray, and sometimes I just pray while I was nursing, but other times I'd nurse and then lay them down and then take that as a little quiet time. And, uh, but I could easily fall asleep if I thought I had to sit or kneel and just fall right to sleep on the couch, but... But I learned to just stand and then just say, thank you, Father. Um, for myself, I just plead the blood of Jesus over myself and just declare the fire of God burning in my heart and in our marriage and uh, for our authorities and for our children. Usually um, name them by name and maybe pray for their future mates and for the generations to come that all my children will be taught by the Lord and great would be the peace of my children. Plead the blood of Jesus over them and friends and family and our city and then our territory near and far that we have influenced and that we will influence in the future. Mm -hmm. And may the beauty of the Lord be upon us and establish the work of our hands and that declares the blood of Jesus, the fire of God, and it, and it keeps me awake. <laughs> so let me just say this to you, that Anne has learned and, uh, and has taught me, it's easier to um, steward that spiritual domain over these five life roles. When she's praying, she's praying each life role, herself, her marriage, her children, her marketplace, and her, her territory, and then out into that other area. And so to the degree our influence has grown, it is because of being faithful with those little things, stewarding our marriage, our time with the Lord, our marriage, our family, our home, and then God takes you out of that because all the same principles operate across all five life roles. We just contextualize it. So here's what I want to say is when you learn as a wife, as a husband, she's brought me along to really manage that spiritual domain. It's a lot easier than controlling your earthly territory. Try to control that earthly territory without, first of all, managing that spiritual domain. So learning to manage that spiritual domain. So here's what I'd like to do is God will give you and he has given you and will renew that vision again. Because maybe you were on your way to Banff and, and you got derailed, you wrecked. Maybe you're still out in the woods and no one's seen you yet and you're, you need someone to come and rescue you. Um, I'm not sure where you're at right now. But that vision, that destination has to get clarified again. Let us pray for you right now. <clears throat> We're going to do three prayers. One is, if you just need a real clear vision again of that destination, because it's faded from you, the picture's faded. You, you, you've drink, you put it in your wallet, and you haven't gotten it out in a while, right? Let's get that destination back out in front of us and get clarity, because the solution lies in that destination. I'm just going to tell you, it will give you the energy to give up, get up off the couch. It will get you back to your knees to pray again. Get that vision clear of that destination again. And then we can help you get a mental map going again, right? And then you'll know the mental map says where you're starting and where you're going. And it helps you to assess where am I starting from. And trust me, the more honest you are with God about where you're starting, the more he'll fill those gaps and he'll repair that vehicle. He'll get it ready and equipped to get back on the road again, okay? He'll help you recover. So let's just take a moment. We're going to pray. <clears throat> if you'll bow your heads. And if those of you, I'm going to pray that God, if this will not take you long because God is speaking and you don't have to beg him to speak. He's speaking. We're just so clouded and distracted we can't always hear his voice. But here's what it sounds like. I'm going to say, I'm going to pray, but God's going to give you a clear picture or a scripture or a word of wisdom. All right?
and you need to hold on to that for just long enough till you can get it written down because it will be like a bubble that will pop in not very long. If you want God to give you, again, a clarity of destination and just give you one short little blurb to get it going, a glance at it, we're going to ask him to do that right now. So let's do that right now. Father, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters who some of them are in the woods and they're in the vehicle and it's damaged and they've run off the road. They're in a ditch of legalism or in a ditch of license and, um, and they want to get back up on the road again where the love of God restores them. The fear of God keeps them off the, out of the ditches. Lord, I, I just pray right now for those of you, if you're saying to God, I want it. You can signify by a hand if you want, or you just, God sees you otherwise. Just tell him, I need a new destination. I need a new clarity of that destination. I need one that will get me moving again, God. And Lord, I just ask that you would give me the word, the picture, the insight, and download it into my heart right now. It could be your time with him. It could be what your marriage, you always wanted it to be. It's not there now. But to renew that, what it would look like to have your family, your children in right relationship. What it would look like if you've got that to, to, to impact your, your marketplace, to have your home be that ministry center. Or maybe all that's done and now you're just waiting for the next step of taking it out to the world. What is the next step and what does that look like? Some of you just need that mental map. You need to be clear about your starting place and the next step. What's the route? What's the trail that gets you to the next place? Lord, I pray you give clarity of the next step. Lord, you said that you would correct our steps. You would lead and guide would you begin to impart in this next week people who would come and, and help them get clarity about the next step in the journey in these life roles? What's the one thing I could do in my walk with God? What's the one thing I could do in my marriage? What's the one thing I could do, the next step with my children, the next step in my marketplace or my ministry outside of that? Just the next step. put it in drive. And Lord, what's the piece of equipping that you want to give to me? The next step of equipping that prepares me to be more capable of running these trails and going on these routes. Lord, how do you want to equip me as an individual with my relational skills, my spiritual skills, my mental skills, my habits? Lord, reveal to us the things that are most important to you that we might be effectively ministering as ministers of reconciliation and love. And would you just come up now and just pray the blood of Jesus over us? Lord, if there's anyone here that has not received your blood covering that you provided as you became obedient to the Father by your death on the cross. And you're speaking that that is their first step, Lord God, to receive that free gift of salvation that cost you your life. And now you're calling you. them to die. Thank you. and no longer live for themselves, but to live for you and you are love. Lord, I just pray for that person, Lord God, that they would get with someone and just pray today that they need that, even this morning. I need to allow the blood of Jesus to cover me yes. and my sins my sin 
And Father, for those of us who know you, Lord God, we just ask for your blood covering, Father God, over our own lives, over our marriage, over our children, and the atmosphere of our home, over our minds and our vision, over our ears that we might be able to hear your voice, over our our minds that we might be able to have the mind of Christ and our hearts, the blood of Jesus cleansing our hearts that we might have the heart of the Father for our own family and filled with your love, your goodness, your power that we can reach out to others. Lord, we can surely do nothing without you, but we, through your resurrection power and living waters flowing in us can flow through us and we can do all things that you're asking us to do especially taking the next step, Lord God, that you are showing us by your might, by your power, and also connecting with others that you put in our lives. I speak divine connections with mentoring relationship. Um, Fathers in the Lord, mothers in the Lord, divine sisters in the Lord who encourage and brothers in the Lord. Thank you and praise you, Lord. Thank you and praise you, Father. And we thank you that you are a holy God. And we plead the blood of Jesus over anyone who is in a sin that has so easily entangled them and they say, I need to get out. That is the first step for me. We say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We submit ourselves to God. We resist the devil. And God's word says he must flee from you. He will flee from you. Thank you and praise you, Father. Thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill us up. Fill us up. Yeah, I sense that there's just a young man who might just be watching off the internet or maybe in here, and you're not even on the journey yet, but you go, I want an adventure. I want a life full of adventure. And you didn't even realize that you can sign up for the journey that's not just on this earth, but it's eternal. And if this is the day that you go, you know what, I want to get on that journey. I want to sign up. I want to have the journey of God for my life. I want to become who God made me to be. I want for my future marriage or my existing marriage. I want what God wants, that intimacy. I want a family that they feel loved and protected by God and by our family. I want God in my life. If that's you, you need to see a pastor here because they will invite you into the, God is already inviting you into that journey and you can get in the car with him. You can get in the SUV with him and that vehicle that can actually ascend the heights of God and to see things you've never seen before and to take you to places you've never even known were possible to get to. But in Christ, all things are possible, he says. And he will equip you to live this life. I pray for you now that you would make that, take that courageous walk to say, I want to be on the journey and meet one of these pastors here. That they can sign you back up for God. <laughs> for those of you who have been wrecked and uh and you wonder how do i even get back on the road how do i get equipped again it took me two more years to get another vehicle equipped to get back out there but i want you to know it was worth everything that i learned in doing that again you learn every time you get back up you get more fortitude more resilience more strength and he says that if you encourage yourself in the lord pursue, overtake, and recover all, it will be better than what you had the last time. And what I want you to know is what I have today is better than what I had the last time. God does that. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. Lord keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and make you to prosper in all your ways. In Jesus' name, Jason. Jason. 
Take something home from that today, church. Good stuff. Amen. Amen. Let's just all stand. Thanks for sticking around a little longer. I wanted to make sure that you got a, you got a dose of what I believe is a life-changing teaching. And one thing I'll add, if your children are grown, it doesn't matter, does it? Just start doing this today. Get your family on mission. Amen. Amen. If you want to just close this out, Pastor Josh. Just sing this as we go this morning. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life Jesus, it's the blood of Jesus, it's the blood of Jesus, thank you Lord, you've washed it all away, hey, I, I, not going to keep you around, but one thing I cannot forget, this guy back here who's playing the little cajon, Isaac Sanders, who I knew him when he played with blocks that were smaller than that, um, he is getting ready to head off to the state of Washington to pursue the next steps of his life. I, um, Ray and Laura and family are back there. Hard to say goodbye, but, uh, but man, when God leads us to go someplace, it's kind of like what you said, Chris, we've got to it's a family on mission and the mission goes off to the uttermost parts of the earth so this guy is taking off tomorrow or is that right Wednesday so be praying for Isaac on his next steps of the journey there is a girl involved praise Jesus um, you know a, a beauty to win and so father we just lift this whole day up to you we thank you for Chris and Ann for the the powerful teaching and I pray transform our lives God Lord, we, we uh, lift up Isaac and we send him off now. Lord, not as a, a guy we'll never see again, but we, with the Sanders family, take him like an arrow and shoot him out into this world and the things you want for him, God. We bless him and we ask that he would have abundant fruit in his life, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome day. Let's thank Chris and Ann for it. Hey, would you?